now that we talked a lot about the trends in migration, we'll talk a little bit about why it really matters. And we think it matters for uh, learning. So I'll talk about learning from migrants. An important fact about knowledge is that we know more than what we can tell. Let's say I know how to fix something. It's much easier from a learning perspective and teaching perspective for me to demonstrate to you how to fix it than to write it down in a manual, send it to you online, and you need to figure it out. Uh, this is why in organization science, uh, people make this uh, parallel to an iceberg. They say 70 to 80 percent of our knowledge is tacit, or um, how we like to call it, it's know-how. Now, the more complex our know-how, our knowledge is, the more important face-to-face -face interaction becomes, because knowledge moves with great difficulties through codified materials like books and manuals. Now, countries where know-how is scarce have a chicken and egg problem. How do you start producing something if there is no one there to teach you how to do it? And this is where migration starts playing a role. Um, Ricardo likes to say it, and I think most previous speakers said this, that it's easier to move brains than it is to move know-how into brains. And we ca I can twist this saying just a little bit to say that you need to move brains in order to move know-how into other people's brains. So you need to move uh, people from know-how rich to know-how scarce places and uh, integrate them into joint uh, work pro uh, programs, work projects, in order to facilitate learning from one group to the other. Um, you heard from many of us that we are engaged in projects in many different countries, and we learn tones about migration policies and uh, migration issues in these countries. Um, and uh, one thing that we have been doing, we have been looking for natural experiments of migration, both within countries and between countries, and return migration, uh, in order to learn uh, about our question, uh, which is, does know-how diffuse through migration? Uh, and I will not do justice to all the work that has been done at CID on this topic, but I've, on, on this question, selected two uh, cases. One is on return migration from Greece to Albania, and the other one is on return migration from the United States to Mexico. So I'll tell the story the other way around. <laughs> um, and then the other, um, uh, can, uh, some other countries where we work have a different kind of issue with migration. Um, uh, here they actually, ha uh, here we have countries where foreign, skilled foreign workers come at their doorstep, something like the United States. So do these countries make the best out of it? Do they learn from one another? Uh, and here I will talk about uh, two projects, um, uh, Panama and Saudi Arabia. Uh, Miguel Santos already covered uh, pretty well these two countries. So I'll summarize some, uh, some of what we find and put it in the perspective of what I'll, uh, what I'll say about learning. Uh, just to mention some names, um, the work on Mexico and United States is the, was done by Dario Diodato and Frank Nevke, uh, who talked uh, this morning. Um, Albania and Greece is joint work with uh, Ricardo. Uh, Panama uh, uh, is work, uh, among others, by Luis Espinoza, Ricardo, Juan Obach, where is he? There you are, um, and Miguel. Uh, and Saudi Arabia is led by Tim Cheston, and the work that I'll present uh, will uh, deal with migration is mainly done by Juan. OK, so the first case is Albania. Um, Albania is a small country on the Mediterranean. Um, it has 2.8 million people, about, uh, and very large migrant communities. So the circles that you see here are the countries in which uh, Albania has uh, migration. And I've zoomed in, so I cut out uh, the United States, where, where they also have a large um, 
my, um, migrant community to, uh, to show you the big circle uh, in Greece. So in 2008, there were uh, some 600,000 Albanians living and working in Greece. But these things changed very rapidly in 2009 when uh, Greece was hit by the sovereign debt crisis. So what you see on this uh, chart are the unemployment rate for Albanian national and Greek nationals in Greece. And what you see is that although they were very similar until 2009, by 2013 they depart and the one for Al uh, Greek nationals reached 27%, but the one for Albanian nationals reached 40%. And this spurred a wave of return migration from Greece to, uh, to Albania uh, that was estimated at a lower bound of 120,000 Albanians, or 5% of the Albanian labor force. So in 2013, we were already in Albania, and we were pretty worried about this. Uh, we were seeing that the economy in Albania was also slowing down, and we were thinking, what are they going to do with this excess labor force that it's returning home? Probably what will happen is that unemployment will go up and wages will go down. And what we saw was, not that. Uh, what we saw was that return migrants were very different from the people that never migrated from Albania. Return migrants, for instance, were male prime age workers. They were the breadwinners of the family that went abroad. And when they returned, they turned out to be uh, twice as, 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 under, as likely to start a firm uh, than were the non-migrants. So what you see here is the share of uh, um, entrepreneurs uh, among uh, return migrants, those with and without employees. As, a, as, as you can see, uh, this is larger, this is actually twice uh, larger than the one for non-migrants, and it's only becoming stronger over time. So the result of this was that in the places in which uh, migrants returned, instead of wages going down, they went up, especially for the unskilled non-migrants. And the way this happened was through uh, job creation through entrepreneurship, mainly in the ag agricultural sector. And uh, they pulled workers from non-participation into participation and from unemployment into employment. So that's Albania. The next case is Mexico. And uh, Mexico, you can see by the asymmetry of, of the circles um, that most people that leave Mexico end up in the United States. What you probably don't see, uh, what, you, uh, what many of us don't know, because it was a surprise actually for many people I talked to, was that um, since recently the, the number of people returning back to Mexico uh, is larger than the number of people coming from Mexico to the United States. So the dashed line here is the number of people going from Mexico to the United States, and it has been dropping since, since 2004. And uh, the full line is the number of people returning back to Mexico. And now if you uh, decompose uh, this line into voluntary and forced uh, returns, you will see that most of these returns are actually forced. So again, unfortunate for the migrants, fortunate for us, we have a natural experiment to study what happens back home uh, when large population is forced to go back to the country of origin. And this is where uh, Dario and uh, Frank give a very interesting twist to the research. They look at the, spe the industrial specialization of Mexico when they are in Mexico, when they are United States, and when, they're, when they come back to Mexico. And what they find is that uh, when Mexicans go to the United States, they kind of blend in. They try to, they, they mimic their specializations, although somewhat different, they mimic the, the uh, economic structure of the United States. When they go back home, they mimic the uh, economic structure of the United States, not of Mexico. And uh, this is how they cause structural change uh, uh, and this is the conclusion of, of uh, Dario and Frank. Um, also, if you're wondering about the effects on employment, they also don't find negative effects on employment of the non-migrants. Uh, as a matter of fact, they find that if you double the returnees uh, in a place in an industry, employment growth increases by 9%. All right, so what 
Albania and Mexico had in common is that these are countries that are relatively poor. They send their people to richer countries, uh, to say uh, countries that are closer to the technological frontier. Uh, their people learn uh, things that are closer to the technological frontier. When they go back home, they transfer this knowledge. Um, in the case of Panama and Saudi Arabia, we have uh, countries that don't have to send their people abroad. Uh, because they attract a lot of uh, skilled foreigners at their doorstep, and the question is, are they making the best use of it? So the first case is Panama. What you see here is a map of the Panama Canal extension project, uh, which was completed between 2007 and 2016. And in this period, Panama uh, had spectacular growth. And not only growth, but also diversification. It diversified even further into financial and logistics services. And as Miguel spoke this morning, uh, these are very uh, hungry on uh, skilled labor. So, um, so in this period, Panama doubled uh, the share of foreign population in, uh, into Panama uh, from 2.5% to almost 5%. Not very much. But the remarkable thing about this migration is that it came from all over the world. These are all the countries from which Panama attracted people. And if you see what they uh, specialized in, so on this chart, these are occupations and everything right from the red line, everything right from one, means that foreigners specialize in these occupations. So foreigners are overrepresented among managers, among professionals, and among technicians. So again, as Miguel explained, um, when foreigners come to Panama, they do the high-skilled jobs. Uh, so Panama, interestingly, uh, if it wants to uh, maintain uh, the, the growth into these high-end, uh, sophisticated sectors, um, it will either have to maintain high level of migration or will have to transfer the knowledge, the know-how from these foreigners to their local people. And is Panama doing this? Uh, not really. So famously, it has this 10% limitation on uh, employment, foreign employment in, F in FDI. Uh, professional visas are very expensive. They are uh, <laughs> north of $7,000 plus renewal fees. Um, uh, if, you want, if you're in a foreign company and uh, if you're a foreigner working in, in a company in Panama and want to sw switch employer, well, you cannot do this. So if you want to transfer your know-how from one employer to another, you cannot do this because visas are employer specific. And uh, permanent residency is excluded, is, is not possibility for three quarters of the countries in the world. Uh, and for those for whom, uh, for which it is, it's north of $10,000. And the last country that I want to talk about is Saudi Arabia. So Panama has the Panama Canal, Saudi Arabia has oil. However, while we are expecting further growth from the Panama Canal, uh, especially into these um, complex services, uh, many are working on making this a history. So uh, Saudi Arabia is very aware that it needs to diversify its, uh, its economic structure, and it's thinking of finding out ways how to do so. Now, we think that it is very well positioned to learn from its skilled migrants uh, not only skilled, but all sorts of migrants that come into their country. Um, after the United States, actually Saudi Arabia is the second largest hub of international migrants and uh, currently hosts 10 million people. Uh, as Miguel spoke this morning, 83% of the private sector is composed of foreign migrants. Now, if you look at the specialization of these foreign migrants, it's kind of the mirror opposite of what we saw in Panama. So in Panama, these were the occupations in which they specialized. In Saudi Arabia, uh, they specialize in the low-skilled occupations. However, the sheer size of the foreign population in Saudi Arabia means that Saudi Arabia hosts uh, about 70,000 foreign managers, 300,000 foreign professionals, and half a million foreign technicians. This is a wealth of know-how that's arriving at the doorstep of Saudi Arabia. And 
Um, as Miguel nicely uh, explained this morning in much more detail, is Saudi Arabia making the most out of it? We don't think so. Um, the social structure is very stratified, making it difficult for know-how to flow from the foreigners to the domestic people. And not only that, but also from foreigner to foreigner if you happen to be from the, two, from the wrong country combination. Uh, similar to Panama, it also has uh, uh, employer-specific visa. So if a foreign worker wants to move from, let's say, a foreign firm to a domestic firm, that's not possible. So to conclude, um, we show that migration is a channel for know-how diffusion from know-how poor, from know-how rich to know-how poor places, even if they are GDP rich places. Um, however, to make full use out of it, uh, they will need to make it easy for people not, to, not only to come in, but also to move around among employers and also integrate and aspire to become permanent residents or at least, uh, not at least, but also citizens uh, so that they can invest the full potential that they have in the country in which they work. Thank you very much.